Hello, Rob. I guess I didn't have to go to work as soon as I thought. I've still got a few minutes. Um, I will continue from this point. Where Jeffers or Sterling talked about two poems from Californians, which I have a copy that I got from some guy in Ann Arbor for like 25 bucks, even though it's worth like 100. Let's find these poems. Wonder and Joy, 1916, Macmillan and Company. Hey, that's the year my house was built. All right, let's find these poems, Californians. Wonder and Joy. Wonder and Joy. I don't see it. That's invocation, though. I don't see Wonder and Joy, buddy. When I behold the greatest. I don't see that either. This. There's one I behold the greatest. There, there, 152. Let's read these, bruv. This book is not very good, regardless of what Sterling said. Wonder and Joy by Robinson Jeffers from Californians. Wonder and Joy, the things that one grows tired of. Oh, to be sure, they are only foolish, artificial things. Can a bird ever tire of having wings? That is not good. And I, so long as life and sense endure, or brief be they, shall never more inure my heart to the recurrence of the springs, of the gray dawns, the gracious evenings, the infinite wheeling stars. A wonder pure must ever well within me to behold Venus decline. Or great Orion, whose belt is studded with three nails of burning gold, ascend the winter heaven. Who never felt this wondering joy may yet be good or great, but envy him not. He is not fortunate. Mm, all right. It's not a very great poet poem. And here's uh, the second poem. When I behold the greatest, when I behold the greatest and most wise fall out of heaven, Wings not by pride struck numb like Satan's, but to gain some humbler crumb of pittance from penurious granaries. And when I see under each new disguise the same cowardice of custom, the same dumb devil that drove our words worth to become apologists of kings and priests and lies, and how a man may find in all he loathes contentment after all, and so endear it, by cowardly craft it grows his inmost own. Then I renew my faith with firmer oaths, and bind with more tremendous vows a spirit that often fallen never has lain prone. Now that's far better than the other one, brav. All right, let us continue for at least 10 or 15 minutes here. Invocation, which I guess we could read right from Californians, but we won't. We'll put them together, though, bro. How's that look? Invocation. O oh, evening star, deep in the deep west burning, far over the faint line of flickering foam, a solitary star and unreturning. But with return of night, thy sisters come, laughing out of the east, but thou declinest. Day wanes no faster than thou fleest home. Thou wilt not, thou in heaven, though in heaven, O divinest, endured, divided glory, nor too near approach, nor multitude. Alone thou shinest. Thou hast precedence in heaven, have it here in song, and in my heart that yearns afar above the wave tops toward thy splendor clear. Lamp of the west, O loveliest wandering star, Thinking how oft at closing in of days, nameless and evening respites of dim war, my fathers looked from unremembered ways up to thy guiding light and sworn at dawn to turn their shoulders dawnward and still gaze the whole day toward the, thy setting and were drawn out of huge Asia past the Euxine Sea, northward of cloudy Caucasus and on. Westward, free wanderers, they would look for thee at fire lighting each night. But when thy face was hidden, there they halted, eagerly awaiting thy new birth, and in that place built huts and plowed the field. 
The light renewed, they rose and tracked westward the wilderness. Now I, the latest in this solitude, invoke thee from the verge extreme and shoal of sand that ends the west. O oh, long pursued, where wilt thou lead us now? What greater goal gleams for our longing down the abysm of time? What weariness of body and worn soul? What farther west? What wanderings more sublime? I mean, I don't understand a word of what he was saying. I was thinking he was railing against the multitude. But the Tao and thither and that kind of takes away from it. Shelley surely would have been proud to sign that poem, written before the days when thee and thou were crimes, as they ought be, bruv. And we made the bad bargain of exchanging emotion for sophistication. It has been alleged that Jeffers, like Poe, adds an abnormal force to his aesthetic impact by choosing themes so dreadful as to be in themselves unforgettable. It is, in fact, a more difficult thing to triumph poetically with the normal. Nevertheless, an enduring memory of work of art, however dreadful, is certainly of more aesthetic importance than a fleeting impression of some mildly pleasing performance. Moreover, moreover, moreover his use of such themes is far from invariable, and we see him bring the saner and deeper if less fascinating matters of beauty and divination as great as those found in Chama and Roan Stallion, for he is a poet as well as philosopher in all on which he brings to bear the fierce light of his imagination, and his work is full of poems in which crystal and granite are equally in evidence. I have already quoted to the stonecutters. Let me add some lines from his majestic night. I know that this age has abjured the sublime, but when it has lost something of its cheapness, the great balance will swing upward once more. He ain't wrong about night. Night's a great poem. Truly, the, spouti the spouting fountains of light, Antares, Arcturus, tire of their flow, they sing one song, but they think silence. The striding winter giant Orion shines and dreams darkness. And life, the flicker of men and moths and the wolf on the hill, Though furious for continuance, passionately feeding, passionately remaking itself upon its mates, remembers deep inward the calm mother, the quietness of the womb and the egg, the primal and the latter silences. Dear night, it is memory, prophecies, prophecy that remembers the charm of the dark. It is for such felicities or for his longer poems that Jeffers will take on the imperial purple. Who can sit in judgment here? Not I, bruv. It seems to me that all share an equal equality. Equal quality. There's, there's no way stuff here. Equality being equal, the longer poems should attain the more irresistible momentum. I have called Tamar terrific. It is all of that and gleams. In addition, with a hundred weird witch lights of beauty, iris corpusants and scarlet will-o'-the-wisps. It is strange to think that this age has bred in its war on beauty hearts that are sealed against such magic, final and, and inexplicable, as his description of a certain ocean sunset, the sad red splendid light. That's it. What constipated soul was it who wrote that no one is any longer interested in sunsets, not even poets? Let him try in his own words to equal that. And what of these lines? First, let's look at this perforation. American Paris Library. And the sea moved on the obscure bed of her eternity. The eastward ran like glass under the peeping stars, and the southwest wind plowed in the blackness of the tree. The red hawk wings of the first dawn streamed up the sky. The coals of ruby lichen that glow in the fog on the old twigs. It was twilight in the room, the shiny side of the wheel dipping toward Asia, and the year dipping toward winter, uncrimson the grave spokes of sundown. Let captious minds term Tamar, if they choose, a tour de force, but this Aeschylean drama of the doubly incestuous house of Caldwell and its ghastly inhabitants stands among the unforgettable dreams of art, as assured of immortality as that of the house of Pelops. Its huge rhythms are those of the very ocean below the granite falcon tower 
October. And for a symbol of it, I am reminded of great serpents coiled around high and translucent jaws of colored poisons. Its folks are abnormal, true. How many of Poe's are not, as history itself been made by mild and average personalities, and is art invariably concerned with the actions of the sane and happy, with the probable instead of the possible? And who are we to clip the wings of the god and fit him with rose-colored spectacles? Roan Stallion, the poem that gives title to Jeffers' lately published book, which includes Tamal, contains much of the tragic horror that informs the latter poem. Here, too, are the long, trampling rhythms carrying in their surge something of the fateful rush of the breaking seas, and here, too, are the same sorceries of objective beauty always inseparable from the work of this poet. Again, I quote, Once thunder walked down the narrow canyon into Carmel Valley and wore away westward. Red rays cried sunset from a trumpet of streaming cloud over Lobos, the southwest occident of the solstice. After the leopard-footed evening had glided oceanward, the night whitened up the bare hill, adrift. I guess these are di different fragments. I'm reading them together as if they're one verse or stanza. The night whitened up the bare hill, a drift of coyotes by the river cried bitterly against moonrise. Enormous films of moonlight trailed down from the height. Of what can this incredible plot be a symbol, if indeed one is desirable? I have not put that question to Jer Jeffers' taciturnity, and I am not sure I care to, but I wish that the tale might have had a more dramatic ending, with the mad woman riding her colossal lover over some canyon wall, even as Lee Caldwell spurred his horse over the granite cliffs of the Mel Paso. I believe that was... Uh... Tamar, not Tamar, Cawdor. Was that Cawdor? Lee Caldwell. As in Tamar, the, state sh the slate should be wiped clean, the dawn, the dawn break on such a battlefield to reveal but the dead. Even Frankenstein's monster was not permitted to attain its pitiful hopes. The obstetrician of horror must not permit such births to survive. The Greek poet never did. As I said, this goes on forever. I will read one more page. I know you're dying to hear me read it. The Coast Range Christ is another drama filled with tragedy essential to literary greatness of the sea hills of Monterey County. Its plot runs far nearer to the margins of normality, but it loses little intensity or interest by reason of that. Here, too, the long lines like an incoming surf carry the reader irresistibly to the conclusion but they are rhyme, the practice that Jeffers has abandoned, nor can I see that the rhyming adds to the aesthetic value of the poem. It marks, I dare say, the transition in the style from conventional forms to the wind-like freedom of Tamar in the latter poems, later poems. I should not give the plot good as it is, but wish to quote as before. In the old Franciscan churchyard feels the wild gourd fingers its grave, finger its graves. Golden head, the gorgeous day came out of the valley to kill dreams. Seagulls weave a windy storm dance over the shore at the Carmel mouth. Marvelous sorcery of the night, the splintered moon gleams, the sun wind gushing. Eating the reckless heart of joy with lips like fire through the loosened hair. Breakers flung back handfuls above the bar across the seafaring moon. Strength of the human soul to suffer or sin to its dreams uttermost. And forget it all in an hour and fling at the stars like a young hawk loose. Mind you, Jeffers treated his poetry writing like a, a nine-to-five job. And he, he went up in the mornings and wrote in the attic as Una, Una took care of the house. And then in the afternoons, I believe he built whatever needed to be built on the property from the remaining structures of the home front or the tower. I've elsewhere written that Jeffers clasped hands with the great Greeks across time, and it has been said, truly perhaps, that Jeffers reaches the peak of his performance in his restatement of the tremendous Electron theme, his Tower Beyond Tragedy, and despite the power, splendor, and intensity of the Elizabethans, 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 one must go back to Aeschylus. I'm, I know I'm 
bastardizing that, to find the match of this drama. It blazes with conven- convincingness, drives on its end like a hurricane, cries out its pathos, terror and beauty as though through brazen trumpets. There is no escape from its march and tidal onset. One watches the Avengers of Agamemnon move to their task, to the cold music of swords and armor. Medusa glares from the palace shadows, her serpents prefigured by the crawling blood from the breast of Clytemnestra and her paramour. Here, horror is redeemed by beauty and the dead dreadful by the sublime. Listen to the flaming eloquence of Cassandra. For me, there is no mountain firm enough. The storms of light beating on the headlands, the storms of music undermine the mountains. They stumble and fall inward. Such music the stars make in their courses. The vast vibration plucks the iron heart of the earth like a harp string. Iron and stone core, O oh, stubborn axle of the earth. You also dissolving in a little time like salt and water. There is no line in this drama that is not alive and alert with an immense conscious power that does not shake with the foreboding passion of doom while perme- permeating all is a sheer and vital beauty. The poem is one of the glories of English literature. What lacks saw keen eyes keen enough to see, souls strong enough to bear the huge weight of this drama and its mates. And I will stop there, Brav.